clarity, reason, common sense, your dose of sanity in an insane world. This is radio in high resolution. And now the most Jewish, non-Jewish man you never met, your host, Pastor Kurt. Hi folks, you're listening to High Resolution Radio. This is Pastor Kurt, and, and I'm so grateful that uh, the, the listening audience that's been participating in High Resolution Radio, we've, we kind of take sometimes a, a light-hearted look at current events that are happening around the world, but I always wrap it up by a biblical prophecy or a biblical principle for you. And I've been uh, spending some time with Rabbi Haim Eisen, and, and he's from Israel. Uh, he is a, I, I say that he is a, a Jewish uh, scholar, that he is a Torah scholar. He says he's a student, but that's the humility of the man. I, I'm going to boast about him, uh, whether he likes it or not. And I'm so grateful because he also has a tremendous love for Christians. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a two-way street, uh, just as much as we love our Jewish brothers and sisters. Our Jewish, our Jewish brothers and sisters are also loving us. And, and so he's come with us today to share some things with us and talk about prophecy and some, some things that bind us together, some things that we still maybe have the occasional argument about in a very loving way. And we agree to disagree agreeably. I, you said that earlier. I thought that was a. I'm going to steal that line from you. We agree to disagree agreeably. It wasn't my line. That's you also appropriated it from. You stole story. that line? I think so. I thought I that know. was your line. That was a, it. Was a great line. Uh, so it's not copyright. I, so Rabbi, I'm so grateful that you're with us, and, and uh, uh, we've been talking about a lot of things. And I didn't give you an, uh, the really from our last interview. I didn't give you the opportunity to really. Uh, uh, answer some of the some of the questions that we had talked about. We started talking about, uh, you, you, you know, when you're when you start talking um, uh, Ezekiel and you start we start sharing. And we were talking in the emotional moment of the the dry bones because they affect both of us. I think in in the same way. And we we were heading towards Ezekiel 38 to talk a little bit more about Ezekiel. And I want to get there, but I had asked you the question, which was. Do you remember? Your question was, how can Christians help? How can Christians help the Jewish people? And, and, and what is, a, what is a, a proper response? In other words, what is, what is something that we know that would be, would, we, would be received if they were receiving it from a Christian and maybe coming across them for the first time? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to recall, if I may, in our last program, the discussion that we had as to why we aren't at one another's throats, or at least at one another's souls, and what I shared with you as to why, from my perspective, I have no agenda to try to persuade you to be anything else, because I believe that by keeping the Noachide Covenant, you are heeding God's charge to you, you are attaining personal salvation, a share in everlasting life, contributing to the final redemption of the world, and that's what the summons that God gave you to do. Um, Jews still await many of our Christian brethren making a reciprocal statement of that sort to us. Now, I fully appreciate that my Christian brethren who would have me adopt Christian beliefs are, at least nowadays, motivated by genuine love. But it's a love without respect. It's treating Jews as a bunch of, excuse me, godless pagans who need to be introduced to God. Which might work let until we open up the Bible and, and sees that God so sent Israel to introduce him to the world. <laughs> Let me tell you something about you that you don't know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Isn't that kind of what, isn't that, and how horrible, how horrible it is that something like that would take place. But I don't think the Christian really realizes what it is they're doing. I appreciate that. I recognize that. But my, my message is that while undoubtedly there is that bond of love between us, there's also a bond of mutual respect. And, and that's an imperative because we can only stand together 
when bound together through both love and respect. Absolutely. So, of course, on, on the one plane, I very well, much appreciate. This is a, a point that has been impressed upon me by many of my Christian theologian friends, that this is more of a challenge for Christians than it is for Jews. Because, again, I have, as a Jew, my perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Noachite covenant. Again, I wasn't telling you why you believe you're saved. I'm telling you why I believe you're saved and why I therefore have no agenda. And why for Christians, in light of the Great Commission, in light of Jesus' words in John, there is a much greater reluctance, even difficulty, in being able to make that reciprocal statement. I'm, of course, not coming to preach Christian theology to Christians. Sure. That's obviously an inner conversation that needs to take place. But I have had the, the joy of participating in that conversation with many of my Christian theologian friends who grapple with this issue and who have to themselves formulated their answers reciprocal with respect to my answer to you as to why I'm not clutching at your soul. Sure. So I have a perspective on that, and I'm not necessarily thinking that you're going to agree with me, because we've, we've touched on it you know, privately to it between us. I, my perspective from a biblical standpoint is this. It is impossible for us as Christians, I don't have the power. God has not given the power to me to change you. It, it, it's not in me. Uh, God doesn't do that really, quite frankly, uh, with, any pa with any pastor or minister. I, I hear people talk about that all the time. But that power is not in us to change who you were into something that we want you to be. Um, that's number one. Number two, you cannot change something that God has ordained. And, and again, this is going to be uh, something that we're not going to agree upon, but I'm just going to only give it from the Christian perspective only. And what Christians should truly understand, because I think if Christians could grasp this, this one point I'm about to make, it would make the relationships that we have with our Jewish brothers and sisters stronger, better, and less uncomfortable. And I believe it, only from that perspective. And, it, and it's this. God has, for, for a time, again, changed his focus. Not that his eye has ever been off Israel because he says his eye is on Israel. His eye is on the Jewish people. He's the watchman, ultimate watchman on the wall. He is there, his hand is on Israel, so I'm not taking any of that uh, away. But there is, a, there is a time, a set time, according to scriptures, that says that the Gentiles will be fulfilled. In other words, that there will be a, 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 a time period that the Gentiles will have the opportunity to be drafted in to the family of God. And, 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 and one of the things, one of the points that Scripture makes, that Paul makes, is that he says I, it, it's, in, it's in the, uh, the 11th chapter of Romans where he states, he says, I will not have you to be ignorant, my brethren. He was speaking, he was speaking to some Christians at the time, and he, but he was also speaking to Jews. He says that you should not know that you should not know what is happening with the Jewish people. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit uh, of the scripture. But what, it was basically say, what he was basically saying is, is that God has placed a veil or he has placed a, a blindness or the inability to understand what we understand as Christians. Now, it's not, I'm not suggesting to you for a moment that we have something that's one up over the Jewish people. I do not believe that at all. But what I am saying is, is that if Christians knew that God had done something, that he had ordained them, that, that, that he had ordained a process for a time period, 
that what Christian in their right mind would ever think that they have the ability to, to change something that God has commanded or ordained. Uh, it doesn't require so much a response, because I, cause I, think, I, think, I think we could go uh, a lot of different directions with that, but I, but I was saying this mostly to the Christian community. You cannot change what God has ordained or willed, if you will. And I, and I, and I would say sometimes in our prayers, we can change how it happens to us but God's will will be done. As from a Christian perspective, I believe that our days are numbered. We don't have many days left. I believe that there is going to be a, a calling of us home and, and where God's full attention will no longer be placed on any of the Gentiles that will be completely and 100% focused like a laser on our Jewish brothers and sisters, as I think it has always been, quite frankly. It's just that he's somehow drafted the Gentiles in for a while. Does that make, does that make sense? To of, of course, I, I understand what you're saying. It's not the first time I'm... I'm it's not the first time you're hearing it. I, I, do, um, I do that. And, and at some point you're going, how much longer is this guy going to go on? Well, obviously, this is a domain in which we will inevitably disagree. Sure. Uh, that is, there is the veil about which we read in Isaiah chapter 25, but it's a veil over the eyes of the nations. Yes. And um, well, I think you've implicitly also agreed that there is very much of a veil over the eyes of the nations with respect to the role of Israel in God's plan. and, and that. Bill can, yeah, needs to be can I, can I want to say one thing about this because this is here's the blessing that's come to me from my Jewish friends and, and, and my blessings from time from being with you is that I'm around the, the Jewish people that I'm around are much smarter and much brighter than I am there's no question about it um, I had a mentor very early in my life that says if you, if you are the smartest person in your circle, you need to get out of your circle and get into a bigger circle. And so I'm surrounded by the, the greatest of what I would say in the Jewish community of the brightest, smartest people I think on the planet. And I would include you in that list. You're very kind. But I must tell you that what your mentor told you is a saying in Ethics of the Fathers, chapter 4, by Rabbi Matia, son of Harash, be a tail of lions rather than a head of foxes. Yes. There you go. Same, same principle. Okay, still a lion. That's exactly right. I, so I wanted to preface that when, I was, when, I'm, when I'm telling I this, that. because there's no way here I'm suggesting that you're uh, not capable of somehow understanding what, what we're talking about in terms of the faith. That, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying, though, is, is that there's going to come a time when the Christians are called home. Those, and I would, I would preface that and say, rather than say Christians, because I would say a biblical Christian, because <clears throat> I think we talked about it a little bit. There's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that are, are not really Christians. And I think that's true. We, we, we've talked about that. It's probably true in Judaism. It's also true uh, in, in probably any other faith out there. There's, there are those that are, uh, what I would say, are chosen and elected by God, both on the Jewish, uh, in the Jewish community as well as, as well as the Christian community. But, but we, uh, would, we would say there are those who choose. There are those, well, yes, there are, they do choose, but ultimately, and we've, uh, we didn't really talk on this very much because I know that you said something about um, in every single one of us is the ability to accept God. Did I get that right? Well, I, 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 if I may share from Deuteronomy chapter 30 because I think it's, it's very much germane sure. to this discussion. If I could just preface to it, I, I keenly appreciate that undoubtedly part of Paul's agenda in Romans chapter 11 was, I think he states it explicitly, to uh, turn away the 
inclination that might lead to prideful arrogance in his Christian brethren. And yet, while I appreciate that that was undoubtedly part of his agenda, as I'm sure you can appreciate, to some degree, inevitably, that formulation is still going to, if not necessarily lead to, breed that very arrogance that, as we see it in the statuary, the, um, the Jew is represented as the blindfolded figure, the Christian as the one who is sighted and straight. Yeah. Um, and what I, what I feel compelled to share, if I may, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 15. See, I have placed before you this day life and the good and death and evil, that I am commanding you this day to love God your Lord, to go in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, and you will live long and multiply, and God your Lord will bless you in the land that you are coming to possess. And likewise, from verse 19, I call heaven and earth to testify this day, life and death I have placed before you, the blessing and the curse, and you shall choose life that you and your seed may live. To love God your Lord, to hearken to his voice and to be adherent to him, because he is your life and the length of your days. Sure. So, but wasn't, but wasn't God saying in that scripture, and you will choose life? Well, it's a plea. Well, I... That is, it's, so, it's, so it's, here's, it's, here's, here's, it is undoubtedly a, small a summons, difference. but it's obviously not a statement of what necessarily comes to pass because we see throughout that God always extends to us the choice and tells us. Sure, he, and you will choose life, I would say, very, is very much a command. Undoubtedly, it's a command, but it's not a prediction, meaning it is, I'm telling you, choose life. Yes. I'm giving you this, take it. Yes. But if it's a choice, indeed, but, if, but, if, but if, if God is saying, I have placed before you this day life and the good and death and the evil, therefore choose life, I'm telling you, they're both in front of you. You can reach for this. God forbid you can reach for this. Please reach for this. Yes. Please reach for life and the good. Right. But I have placed death and evil before you. Yes. And you can choose whichever one you want. Yes. But if you, if you look at it from a Christian perspective uh, at, at, at the power of the Holy Spirit, that comes upon us. In other words, <clears throat> we were not born into Christianity. At some point, we were touched, turned on, flipped a switch, whatever you want to call it, that we were heading in one direction, which was a, which was a, a direction towards evil. And, and I love what, how, you, uh, how you pronounce it is really, you're coming home. But, but we, made a, we, we made a change. We made a change in our life where we were, we were heading down a path of destruction, a, a life of, of, of complete and total sin. And, and even as a pastor, I'm the first to admit, I am a sinner. I wish it were not so, but I am a sinner. I, I know that my sins will be forgiven, but I also every day in my prayers, just as you have your prayers every day, in my prayers, I'm always asking God, for forgiveness of, we are, we are of, of, uh, uh, with a repentant heart every day, which I actually noticed uh, when I was reading in our, because uh, I was at prayer with you last night, yes. uh, uh, and uh, which, which was true, which I, when I saw that, I thought, there it is. There's the repentant heart. And it's one of the things that Christians do not do because they seem to think that because they're saved by, the, by, by Jesus, the Messiah, they think that they, they have this, and, and there's truth in that, but let me say this to you. If you want to be in communion with God, just like our Jewish brothers and sisters are always in communion with God, it's not a ritual for them. It's something that, they're, that, that when they're reciting their prayers, they're adding to all of those, those prayers, the, the things that they so desperately need from Hashem to, to be able to bless them abundantly. We come with, with a request from God for all the things that we want in our life, 
but very few of us repent on a daily basis for who we are. We seem to think that our sins are forgiven and, and, and in the grand scheme of things that they are. But you see, our Jewish brothers and sisters are always in communion with God. If you want to be in communion with God, you must always have a repentant heart. Absolutely. It, it, it's required. It's, it's, uh, it's not something. It's, it, and, and I think you and I had talked about it a little bit the other night. That goes to speak about humanity and again about the depravity, if you will, for lack of a, for lack of a better word, the depravity of who we are or who we were and, and, how, and how God changes us, that he brings us to a point of understanding and knowledge that is different for all of us. Your, your, knowledge, your knowledge of the Torah um, uh, and the, of the prophets is far greater than mine. I have been, I've enjoyed listening to you and being able to pick up on some things that uh, I, I didn't think of in that direction and, I, and it brought to light even more. So there's that side of it. I would probably have the ability from a New Testament to share some things, maybe not enlighten you, but maybe share a perspective as to why we're, you know, the uh, crass, sometimes rude people that we wish that we were not. <laughs> when, it comes, when it comes to this understanding, and this is, but this is what it's all about for us to be able to have this dialogue and to be able to share because really in some of the things that we've talked about there is far more in common that we have than we have in terms of being different. He would, you're right, he, and he never did. Right, so. He never did. He never did. You know, it's really, it's really not until, uh, until Paul comes on the scene uh, for the Gentile, because, you know. Which is also not contradicting the words of the Torah, because the words of the Torah obligate Israel. They don't obligate the Gentiles, as we discussed in Acts chapter 15. Right. But, but so as a result, I know, um, again, as I shared with you, I have uh, quite a number of very dear friends who are Christian theologians, and um, they have, over the years, presented to me their resolutions of how to understand the words of Jesus in light of Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm not telling you what your theology should be, obviously. I, I have enough of a full-time job with my theology. I'm not telling Christians what their theology your, your plate's is. Your plate's full. Right? But, um, <laughs> but just to, to what I will share is what these Christian theologians, friends of mine, have shared with me. Um, a very dear friend expressed it, that he indeed believes that Jews are saved through the Son because they keep faithfully the Torah and the commandments, in the hereafter, it will emerge that they were saved through Jesus. Obviously, that's not the reason I believe we're saved. But I respect that just as when I tell you that I believe you're saved because of the Noachide Covenant, and you're thinking to, my, to yourself, oh, I don't think I'm saved because of the Noachide Covenant, and I'm not telling you why you're saved according to you. I'm telling you why you're saved according to me. Sure. I appreciate that he was telling me not why I'm saved according to me, but rather why I'm saved according to him. In other words, that he See, he was He was using the framework of works in order to be saved. In other words, well, he says, because you've done this, 
because you've done these things. But he, he, it was more subtle. In other words, I'm not, I'm not going to speak on his behalf, but... Um, get, him on not, the get him on the phone, will you? <laughs> no. <You're sorry. laughs> but the, not most seriousness, that is, his point was that while he will describe it as grace, it will be grace due to the fidelity to the Torah. I mean, of course, the truth of the matter is, it goes without saying that when we speak of our fidelity to the Torah, if you ask me, is fidelity to the Torah by itself sufficient to attain salvation? Well, we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, there's no man righteous in all the earth that can do good and not sin. So sin is indeed an inevitability. Sure. How is it then that fidelity to the Torah can be the basis of everlasting life? The word, in one word, is teshuvah. We've discussed it before. Usually translated as repentance, more precisely rendered, as we noted in the first book of Samuel, chapter 7, verse 17, as returning home, right. that God gives us that gift. His hand is always extended to us in inviting us to return to home. We see in particular in Ezekiel chapter, chapter 18 and chapter, chapter 33, many other passages as well, but there in particular, this summons, come back. Just return to God and live. So the, the gift that God gives us, which you're welcome to call grace, is not only giving us the Torah, but giving us that roadmap called Teshuvah that always invites us home. Yes. Now, this, is, this was the solution that one friend gave me. Another friend told me that he feels he must temper the meaning of John's words in light of Deuteronomy chapter 30. And another possibility that I uh, was very intrigued to hear not long ago because I had actually had the idea myself, but I didn't have the temerity to tell Christians that maybe they should be thinking these terms, is if Christians believe, as you read in the Gospel of John, that the Word became flesh, that may apply indeed to all other nations. Yes. But God gave Israel the Word as Word. That's right. And that pla places through, matters on a different Israel. plane. Through Israel. Right. right. So that Israel still has the Word. There isn't anything else. That, that, and that is critically not only the necessary, but the sufficient basis for God summoned to Israel to come to him. Well, folks, you've been listening to High Resolution Radio. I have with me Rabbi Haim Eisen, and he is, uh, he, he's been just giving us so much great insight into, into Judaism and a better look uh, at how, uh, a, a look at how Christians and Jews can interact together. I, I'd like to describe it more as a look into this as the basis upon which both Jews and Christians stand together, this profoundly powerful platform of the Word of God. That's right. And that brings me to one, I still haven't answered your question, you know, about how to help. Because I do feel compelled to share one additional, and to my mind, perhaps the most important message. Because I do keenly appreciate the extent to which Christians, in particular, since the Holocaust, have given of themselves so unstintingly to the Jews, but the greatest help is to also be prepared to receive. Yes. There are those who are very happy to give, but to receive, to recognize, again, that as I do keenly appreciate, more and more Christians recognize that in order to deepen their connection with God, they need to return to the Hebraic roots of Christianity and to hear the Torah teachings. Torah means teaching, teaching of God. To hear the Torah teachings that Israel has vouchsafed from time immemorial, since Sinai, to be able to share that. This, to me, is what drives me more than anything else. To be able to share the Word of God with Christian believers, to share the Word of God when I come on these lecture tours to share the Word of God online. Why do you think God created the internet? Sure. So that the Word of God goes forth from Jerusalem, as he said it in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And also to share with Christian believers who come to Jerusalem. I'm not going to say it's my town, it's God's town, but I do live there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the that's only place that God says, Iri, my city, 
Isaiah chapter 45, verse 13, we know which city he's talking about. Yes. And, and to be able to share with Christian believers in the Holy City, we have our Holy City tour to give Christians an opportunity, not merely to tour Jerusalem through the Bible, but to tour the Bible through Jerusalem. And, and this is a great thing. I'm, I'm so grateful that you brought it up because the perspective of, the, of what we consider the Old Testament or the Torah is so important to us. Um, we see something a little bit different. We see, actually, we see Christ through the Old Testament coming into the New Testament. We see him sprinkled throughout, throughout the, the word. However, I believe with all my heart and always have that the Old Testament is just as relevant as the New Testament. Uh, it, is, it is every bit as irrelevant, and Christians need to know that. And when you want to talk about receiving and also being able to receive yourself, being able to receive as, uh, from, from the Jewish people the, the, the greatness of, of the understanding of God's Word, um, there's nothing better than having a great scholar such as you uh, to be able to, to enlighten and to be able to share and give to us something that I think is so desperately needed. Many people don't think that the Old Testament is relevant, and I'm here to tell you, you that it, you are wrong in that thinking. The Old Testament is extremely relevant, and, and it is so important to us, uh, both, both in the, in the, in the storyline, also understanding this, which I think so many Christians miss, is we miss the holiness of God. What I mean by that is sometimes in the Christian faith we treat, we treat uh, Christ when we speak to him uh, like he's our next door neighbor, like he's, like he's a, a friend. And at the same time we don't recognize or we don't recognize as much as we should the character of who God is, understanding that He is a God that blesses, but He's also a God that curses, that He's a God that is of love, that God cares very deeply for us all, uh, that, that we have this understanding of who He is. You know, when you and I were talking about Isaiah, I was sharing with you how I, Isaiah, the sixth chapter, is one of my favorite chap chapters, and you've, you gave me a great perspective on Isaiah. But when I see Isaiah going into the throne room of God and the oneness of what he's receiving and what he's seeing and then what he's, what he's bringing back, put, putting pen to parchment and being able to write down the, the vision that God has given him to see, we see the true holiness of God in that chapter where it is laid out for us to know that even though Isaiah was called up and invited to be there, he knew once he was there that he did not belong, or at least not yet. Well, life is always in that vein, from our perspective, going to be drawn out between the parallel poles of love of God and the reverence of God. So the love always impels us to want to come close. Yes. The reverence, as we read in Ecclesiastes, is knowing that God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Yes. To recognize that we aren't there. Yeah. And to appreciate that living in the tension of love and reverence is really the gift of being able to live every moment right. in service of God because the love impels us always to want to come as close as we can. The reverence tells us, express that love in this world because you're not in heaven. That's right. Uh, another, another way to say it that's a little bit more kraus and a little bit more crude is to say it that God is holy and you are not. <laughs> and, but you do have a summons to be holy. But we do. We have a summons Leviticus to be holy. chapter 19. Be but holy. That, but that summons that we're having does not really uh, fully sanctify itself. No, that, that is, but, but it is a summons. Be holy because I am holy. Yes. Says God. In other words, what that signifies, obviously, 
in our tradition, what holiness means, most essentially, is separated. That, that obviously is in cognizance of our living in what is essentially a mundane world. I didn't say defiled, but a mundane world. And being able to take our lives and ultimately take everything around us and elevate it to God means separating from that mundaneness and consecrating. And that, of course, is an ongoing mission for all of life. How awesome. So, Rabbi, we're getting ready to close, but I wanted to, I, I wanted you to just sh share some parting thoughts with our audience, because although we have a lot of, a lot of uh, the Jewish listeners and a lot of dear friends that listen to, the, to our show, um, predominantly the audience is Christian and, by the way, atheist. We have quite a few atheists that which is kind of an oxymoron because even an atheist is a theologian, aren't they? Sort of. You have to think about it a it's little bit. But that's a longer discussion. What would, you, what would your parting thoughts uh, be to the Christian community? And, 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 and just, share, just share a couple of minutes with that before we wrap. I feel very keenly that we're living, I used this expression to you last night, in a period of clarification. That is, God is summoning everyone to choose. Are you with God or without God? And we see this happening more and more. It's an accelerating process everywhere I go, even more than in the US, in Europe. The forces of godlessness are getting stronger, but I believe the forces of godliness are also getting stronger, certainly more passionate. As the fence sitters disappear, everyone has something to choose. We live in an era an information age in which the battle lines are drawn not between nations, even within families, even perhaps within individuals. Do I allow the side that is with God to predominate or not? That process of clarification is in itself a blessing. And it is, I believe more than anything else, what readies the world for God's kingdom. Now, it readies the world for God's kingdom via that final battle of the forces of godlessness about which we read in Ezekiel chapter 38 and Zechariah chapter 14. You know, on the one hand, I often used to say, and I, I still say, is it possible for that final battle to be a battle that will be waged within the hearts of every single human being and the side that's with God will prevail and there won't need to be an actual battle in Jerusalem? Is it possible? Well, to respond as we often do to one question with another, when the prophet Jonah came into Nineveh and announced another 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned, did it happen? No. Well, I disagree. A city that was so depraved that God sent the prophet Jonah to warn it. And everyone returned to God and repented and put on sackcloth and abandoned all of the iniquity that had characterized them. If that's not overturned, I don't know what is. Well, in that regard, yes. Exactly. Now, ironically, the prophet Jonah himself didn't appreciate that would be the fulfillment of the word of God. That it would be fulfilled through that kind of overturn. So could the battle be fought internally in the future as well? It's possible. But here's the caveat that I feel compelled to add, certainly over the course of the last few years, looking around at the world might happen, but it sure doesn't look like it. It looks like the world is becoming increasingly polarized and arrayed as the forces of godlessness and the forces of godliness. And that more than anything else, I believe, is the summons that God is giving us. In the words of Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, I have given you as a light of the nations that my salvation will be to the end of the earth. Can we be guarantors of anyone choosing to stand with God? No. We believe every human being has freedom of choice. But we have a charge to bring that message to the world. And I believe we do it by our standing together. As I stated earlier on that I believe God is giving us the threats and challenges so that when they're all past, we will be standing together for His glory. 
And that, more than anything else, I believe, is the message that, jo- that God is charging us to convey first to ourselves and finally to the world. That when we stand up against those forces of godlessness, we have only one weapon, teaching. The best way to educate is by setting an example. When Jews and Christians can stand together, as in the words of Zephaniah that we've already discussed, chapter 3, verse 9, then I will change to a pure language for all peoples to call all of them in the name of God to serve him shoulder to shoulder. So of course, ideally, that's Hebrew. But still, I keenly feel that when I quote the words of the Bible as God's will revealed in his word to Christian audiences around the world, and I know they hear it exactly the same way, God's will revealed in his word, that's a profoundly powerful platform upon which we stand together and through which we project the word of God, through which we project that teaching that may transform the world. It's only by God's charge and it's God's miracle that has brought us together. But when God gives us an opportunity, it instantly morphs into a responsibility. God gave you an opportunity and you didn't rise to the summons. So I believe we have a responsibility to seize this blessed opportunity that God has given us to project this message to the world. And uh, if I may, I'm very grateful to you, Pastor Kurt, for this opportunity to come together. And I'd love to be able to reach out to all of you, an opportunity for us to continue to grow together through the Word of God, through the teachings that God has gifted to us and charged us to gift to the world. Amen. Amen. Rabbi, Rabbi Haim Eisen, I'm so grateful that you are here with us. It's so amazing. It was awesome. I couldn't ask for it to end any better than just that. Folks, you've been listening to High Resolution Radio. Make sure you tell your friends about High Resolution Radio. Go on YouTube and make sure you hit the subscribe button. Also, I want to encourage you to go to High Resolution Radio on Facebook. It is the drudge page of the Middle East. You will know in a matter of moments and be up to speed on everything that's happening. God's eye is on Israel. Your eye should be on Israel loving and blessing the Jewish people with all you have. Until next time, this is Pastor Kurt bidding you very a farewell. And always I close with the priestly blessing over your life. And it comes from the bottom of my heart, as well as from rabbis, to all of you. Now may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may he be gracious unto you. May he give you his peace. May your knowledge continue to increase in the word of God. And may you know that it is our duty and love for the Jewish people to look after them and to bless them and to be there for them, to handle and to take care of them in the material things that they have. I pray for this blessing over you, over your families, and that they would be blessed abundantly from this. And I ask and give it all in the name above all name, our Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of which I believe is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That sets us up for the next time that we get to come together. God bless you, God willing. We'll see you next week. Well, you've been listening to High Resolution Radio with your host, Pastor Kurt. Now that you know what he thinks, tell him what you think by dropping him a line at highresolutionradio.com or High Resolution Radio on Facebook. He values your opinion and your feedback as he teaches in a brand new way. As always, we appreciate your support of this broadcast with your financial contribution and by sharing this message with your friends. To donate now and be a part of our global online community, visit highresolutionradio.com and click on the Donate Now button. Now that you're armed with knowledge, go out and fight the good fight. And until next time, stay sane, everyone.